Okay, so it's uh, 5 p.m. here. Good local time to everyone, and welcome back to the BDEF CPR seminar series. Uh, after uh, two months, which seemed like an eternity uh, of a pause, we're, we're back. And this time, we're very happy to have uh, Nancy Chan from Northwestern University uh, presenting. So um, most of the people I see here are usual attendees, but you might have forgotten about the mechanics of the seminar. So let me give you a quick reminder. Uh, the seminar will run for an hour. And after that, we'll have 15 minutes for a Q&A where you get a chance to uh, just virtually raise your hand and we'll open up the microphone for you uh, to, to ask your questions uh, to Nancy. During the presentation, uh, let, let's please use the Q&A function uh, of, of Zoom to make your questions. Um, and we'll, we'll make a couple of pauses during the talk in which we'll select a handful of questions and pass them along uh, to Nancy uh, to, to answer them. Um, Erika, uh, who is a co-author in the paper is here, so she'll be answering a, a few questions also uh, on, the, on the chat. Uh, please do not take offense if we don't transmit all your questions to the speaker. Uh, it's not because the questions are not interesting or bad, but just that we have a, a very limited uh, amount of uh, time. Um, also, uh, we've taken a look at the slides, so some questions may be answered throughout the talk, and, and those will just mark them as, as uh, respondent. Uh, we'll ask you for your help in screening the questions. So if you, th if you see a question that is, uh, you think is interesting, uh, please just vote them up uh, or down and, and we'll see them first. Um, needless to say, of course, aggressive or abusive behavior will not be tolerated here. We have enough with what's going on outside. Uh, so yeah, without further ado, uh, thank you very much, Nancy, for, for virtually visiting us. Uh, the floor is yours for the next hour. So first of all, let me say thank you so much for letting me speak and share my work and get comments at this amazing virtual platform. And uh, the second thing I want to say is an apology in advance. I have two very young children who are being homeschooled this year. They're outside right now, but if you at some point you hear screams of either joy or pain, that's what's going on in the background. <laughs> um, Okay, so I'm going to talk about a paper that I've been working on for a couple of years with Erica, who's here and will answer questions in Q&A, and Aisha, who is unable to join us. Um, the paper, the working title is Aid Crowd Out, the Effect of NGOs on Government Provided Services. Let me quickly motivate and explain how we got interested in this project. We came in from a couple of different directions. The primary one was our interest in foreign aid. As you all know, foreign aid is the most important tool for, uh, in terms of mo in monetary terms for rich countries to transfer wealth to poor countries. And the goal is to create sustainable development. Massive amounts of money has been transferred in uh, the post-World War II decades. However, in recent decades, there's been a lot of concerns expressed by economists as well as aid workers, right? So uh, these can be broken down into a couple of categories. One is that aid is tied to donor objectives rather than the needs of the recipient countries. Another is that aid might actually hinder government, you know, however, whatever the objectives are, aid might hinder uh, the government capacity of the recipient countries, and that could increase aid reliance, right? And closely, uh, closely related to that is this concern of moral hazard that aid reduces the recipient governments to improve institutional quality. So sort of with all of this in the backdrop, uh, NGO distributed aid become, became very popular. And the main reason, one of the main reasons is that NGOs are seen and have been shown to be more independent from the strategic objectives of large donors and large institutional donors. And so kind of with this, um, with this idea in the background, the amount of aid that's been uh, distributed by NGOs to poor countries 
And the number of NGOs has quadrupled in more than quadrupled in the last 20 years. And a lot of aid, I think, for countries such as the US and EU, you know, over 10% of the total amount of money that they're giving out are actually now being distributed by NGOs. Now, of course, you know, with the rise of NGOs, uh, NGOs also receive more scrutiny. And some of the criticisms, actually, I would say the main criticism levied at NGOs uh, is that one, they compete for limited resources. Uh, so, you know, they, they might, they often are seen as offering higher wages than what the local, the recipient government can afford to do, can afford to offer. And when they do that, they poach skilled workers from those countries. And uh, skilled workers are in limited supply, so this could actually hinder the development of government capacity, right? And this is important if the ultimate goal is creating sustainable development. For sustainable development, at some point, we need the recipient governments of the poor countries to start providing those services, right? Um, okay, so our research question is pretty straightforward, which is, does NGO-administered aid help or hinder native public capacity? And we're going to be able to address that in one specific context, you know, like any empirical paper. Okay. So I just want to say, you know, what are the main challenges? First, the existing arguments, of which there are many on both sides of the question from many different contexts, they're typically anecdotes or impressionistic. We don't really have systematic quantitative evidence from any given context, right? And part of the difficulty is data limitation. It's really difficult to measure government capacity in a very poor context. You know, what's the correct measurement? Typically, when we think of state capacity in a cross-country context, we think of taxation, uh, military conscription. That seems much less relevant in our context, where we're just thinking of state capabilities in terms of providing really basic services to the community. The second difficulty, you know, which is almost ubiquitous across all empirical studies is, of course, causal identification. You know, what if we saw a relationship between aid and reduced government capacity in the recipient country? It was really difficult to say that that association is causal. It could be reverse causality because we target aid if we target aid as we should towards countries that have lower capacity. Right. So one of the one of the initial mandates of NGOs and its core mission is precisely that to act as a stopgap where there where the government has no capacity. They're meant to go where government has no capacity. So of course we are going to see a negative association between NGO and uh, and government capabilities. Okay, the second issue is joint determination. You might think that low recipient government capacity and aid are both outcomes of other problems. You know like weak government, weak states in general, the presence of conflict, you know, so on and so forth. We can all come up with a lot of examples of very relevant omitted variables for this context. So what we're going to try to do in this paper is to address these two issues in one specific but very policy relevant context. We're going to estimate the causal impact of aid delivered by NGOs on the recipient government. And by and specifically, we're going to focus on government provided services uh, that are meant to that of the similar type of the NGO provided services. For causal identification, we're going to exploit a random variation in the rollout of the NGO. And the main outcomes we look at to measure government capacity is the number of government workers who provide similar services as the NGO in the same location and the service provision, right? So first is the workers and number of workers, and second is government supplied services. The context we look at is rural Uganda, uh, which is one of the poorest parts of the world. Uh, we're going to be looking at aid delivered by a very large NGO using a random rollout that was conducted as part of an internal evaluation that they did. Now, one thing to mention is that the NGO and the government, in our case, aim to provide very similar basic health services. The main difference is that the NGO offered much higher compensation than the government for the workers. And I'm, I'm going to come back to this in a lot of detail. Um, so again, 
our context is very, the, the results that I'm going to talk about should be interpreted as specific to the context of our study. At the same time, our context is very policy relevant. And I'll talk about the specific dimensions of the context and why it's relevant and how we should interpret the results with as much uh, care as I can manage in the next uh, 50 minutes or so. Okay. Okay. So, so how should we think about the effect of uh, the NGO ex ante? Actually, it's ambiguous, right? So on the one hand, you have the criticism that's being levied by public health work, by the public health community and the aid community, which is that higher wages attract government workers, and this can poach government workers and reduce government capacity. You know, but there is a flip side to this, which is that these are communities where, you know, for things that we're looking at, like basic health services, villagers know very little about this. They've had no, almost no access to modern health services historically. So you might think that when the NGO comes, there could be positive spillovers, right? NGO entry can actually educate the villagers about the value of these services. They can see the value of these services. And this could increase the number of people who are willing to work to provide these services for both the NGO and the government. So there could be positive spillovers. You know, we're gonna be getting the net of these two in our study. Okay. So what do we find? What we find is that when NGOs enter, they reduce government capacity in villages that already had a government worker. So for villages that already had a government worker, uh, you know, NGO random, randomized NGO entry reduces the number of government workers. Uh, it reduces the amount of services provided by government workers. Now in villages where there was no government worker when the NGO randomly rolled out, we don't see any positive spillover. So there's no effect on, uh, there's, no, there's no increase in government health workers. So these results support the crowd out concerns. And in the meantime, we don't see positive spillovers. And I should mention that we're looking two, three years out. So you can think of these as short medium run results, right? And long run results could be quite different. Okay. So what are the policy implications in the short and immediate run, in the medium run? Well, um, so one thing is that this is consistent with the concern that it could increase long run aid reliance. Of course, like I mentioned in the long run, there could also be positive spillovers that we can't mention. But let's just focus on the short run and medium run now, right? Even in the short and medium run, we might think that the, the NGO it might crowd out government provision, but the NGO might just provide better care. And this, and this is important because this could improve population well-being, and we need to take that into account when we're thinking about policy design. So what are we going to do? We're going to examine the effect of NGO entry on total service provision. So are you getting any services from anyone? So that seems important, important. and also health outcomes. And of course, when we do this, you know, it's important to allow the effects to differ for places with and without a pre-existing health worker, since we found that crowd out of services differ for these places. And one thing to mention, though, is once we start thinking about well-being and total service provision, it's going to, the results should depend, it will and should depend on the NGO pay structure and the incentives to provide health services. And here, you know, our study has an advantage and a disadvantage. I'll say the disadvantage first. The disadvantage, again, you know, whatever our, our results we tell you, it's specific to the context of uh, the model that our NGO uses. The advantage, and, and that's going to be true with any study with, of any given NGO. Now, the advantage is that our NGO uses a very popular model that's getting a lot of awards and attention these days in the aid community. It's often called the Avon model, right, which pays health workers to provide health services as a way of funding the uh, pays health workers to sell stuff as a way of providing funding the free health services that they provide to the community. So I'm going to come back and talk about the incentive structure uh, in a lot of detail during the talk. Right now, let's, let me just tell you what we find. So what we find is that NGO entry reduces services, increases infant mortality, and worsens health behavior in villages where the NGO hires the government health worker. Now. Um, like I said, I'm going to go into a lot of details of what incentives are driving this later in the talk, but whichever the case, whatever that is, these results are consistent with, the, with this concern from aid workers in the aid community that the limited supply of skilled workers, 
makes poaching from NGOs to be a very big problem for these countries, right? And then at the same time, I want to mention that the, our results don't undermine the view that NGOs are very good in, pro, in being a stopgap in places where there are no government, where, where the government isn't able to provide any services. So in places where there's no government presence, when the ONGO enters, it, there's no effect on government health workers, but it does increase total service provision and it seems to reduce infant mortality. Okay, so these are our main results. Now, um, I just want to, uh, I just want to pay respect to the vast amount of literature on aid and more recent literature on worker incentives and NGOs in contexts like ours. So recently there's been um, a couple of papers that have been trying to get at these questions that are related to sort of our main insight, which is that uh, government provided services could be very important and even uh, more important than foreign assistance and helping sustainable development and that there are important general equilibrium effects of aid, right? So there's a couple of papers showing that a foreign aid can reduce private contributions. And in food aid, there's been a couple of papers showing GE effects that food aid, in-kind food aid can reduce local farm gate pr prices. So in the context of these studies, we're just highlighting a different type of general equilibrium spillover effect or unintended consequences if you want. And then of course, recently there's been a lot of studies that's been looking at that's trying to identify the causal impact of aid on different outcomes in different contexts. And we add to this also. And, um, and then there's another strand of literature outside of aid that's just trying to evaluate the effect of NGOs and contact NGOs like ours in contexts like ours. And the evidence is mixed, it sort of depends. You know, there's positive, no negative effects, uh, even with very good identification, like with RCTs. And one possibility that our paper and several other, re other recent papers point to is that one explanation for this mixed finding could just be that these average effects are obfuscating important underlying heterogeneity. And in that sense, our paper in, in the context and the outcomes we look at, our paper is most closely related to a paper by, um, by Bjorkman et al. And which also, this isn't their main result, but they also find some evidence that when the NGO enters, uh, people get are less likely to get health services from government workers. So they, so this is this is consistent with our finding of crowd up. And then finally, there's been a couple, just a few recent papers that's been kind of digging into this idea, uh, digging into this question of how career financial career and financial incentives can affect the selection of altruistic workers in context similar to ours. Okay. So this is a roadmap of the talk. Are there any questions at the moment? Uh, um, just a couple of, of yeah. clarification questions, just general definitions for people who are not in the literature. Uh, some people are wondering what precisely you mean by state capacity um, and um, where does the aid goes, uh, which here I think you interpret the NGO as being, being international aid basically, no? Um, and then, yeah, the basically general the definitions. And then the other ones are, are going to be answered throughout the presentation. Yeah, so those are really important questions. So uh, the question of what do we mean by government capacity? What we mean is simply uh, the ability of the government. To, uh, we're going to be looking at Uganda. So we're going to be looking at the ability of the public services provided by the Ugandan government. Uh, and their ability to provide these services, right? Like are in a given location when the NGO enters, uh, what happens to the number of government workers or what happens to the presence of uh, government services, similar services, and um, that's what we need. So you can use, so we tried using the word state capacity in the past and that caused a lot of confusion. So we're moving away from that. I mean, on some level, uh, and we're happy to take advice and suggestions on the right word. Now we're just using government capacity. If we think of like the Dalbo Finan paper, you can also see state cap capabilities. But really we're just talking about local uh, government provided local public services of the same type as what the NGO is trying to provide. And the second question of where does the NGO go? 
So the NGO we're looking at goes all over rural communities over many, many poor countries. The context that we're studying, like our, uh, our evaluation is going to be looking at rural communities in uh, Northern and Central Uganda. Okay. So let me keep going and uh, please do feel free to ask questions. Uh, and Erica, you know, is there to answer all the really hard ones. All right, so let me, I'm going to talk about the background as succinctly as I can. Um, I'm going to discuss the empirical strategy very quickly. This is a randomized evaluation, so the empirical strategy is pretty straightforward. Then I'm going to talk about the main results on government capacity, uh, which is, again, looking at the government, the presence of government workers and government provided services in the community where the NGO enters. And, uh, and then I'm going to try to interpret what those results mean and what the implications are for policy, at least in our context, by looking at well-being. And this is going to, uh, by looking at well-being total services, and mostly we're going to be focused on mortality and as our measure of well-being. And when we do that, uh, I'll also try to interpret what we think these results are telling us uh, in terms of the implication of this Avon model that's getting a lot of awards in a lot of places. Okay, so let me go on a little bit. Um, and I'll try to remember to stop periodically for questions. And if I don't, John Marco, please just interrupt. Uh, okay, so let me just say a little bit about our context and I'll stick to a need to know basis. So the, we're looking at a very poor place. So per capita income in Uganda is $522. We're looking at one of the poorest places. One, we're looking at the poor regions of Uganda, in, uh, in rural Uganda. In the area that we're doing our evaluation, which is pretty representative of many parts of rural Uganda, there's very little access to medical care. So in terms of modern medicine, there are only two sources. These are government workers uh, and NGO, the, the people we're studying. And both of uh, these services provide home visits and basic uh, health care advice that I'll talk about in a second. Now, the other sources of medical care come from traditional healers, which, you know, give traditional herbal remedies and intermix with some superstitious beliefs and some useful practices, you know, tried and true over time, together with drugstores. So drugstores are present in some of these communities and they dispense advice while dispense selling medicine, you know, so you buy an aspirin, and so you should take it when your head hurts, uh, take one pill every time you have a head headache. So pretty basic advice. Okay. Now in urban areas, there are other sources of medical care. So there are private clinics, government clinics, and health centers, these that provide modern medicine. Okay, so the government health program aimed to provide free basic health services during home visits. And what does this program do? So when the health workers come to your home, come to the home of poor rural, uh, poor rural households, and they provide health, basic health education, like they talk to you about the benefits of hospital delivery, methods of disease prevention. They talk to you about the, they provide postnatal checkups, right? Again, septicemia and other things where if, uh, that are very serious and which if there's a serious problem or a sick or a sign of a problem, they would tell you to go to the local health clinic in an urban area and they help you coordinate that visit. And if there's no problem, you know, everything's fine. So they also provide basic medical advice, and uh, and they also pro they also provide um, and they also refer you to health clinics in during prenatal times. For example, they'll say, "Well, you know, your baby is there's this is breached. The baby hasn't turned. It's very important for you to go uh, for you more than anyone else. You should really, really go and deliver in a clinic." And while these things are quite basic, uh, they are they are they are also for, when relevant, it's also the difference between life and death for the mother and child. Now, uh, in addition, they provide basic medicines free of charge. Uh, these are really basic things. Again, uh, but again, these have they, they can have big impacts in places where that are very poor, where access is very limited through other sources. Now, all workers are given a, are given basic training by the government, a uniform, and medicines for distribution. All workers are recruited locally from the same community. Uh, they can be men and women, or they can be men or women. They tend to be women. 
Okay. The program by the government was officially established nationally in 2001, but the government did not have the capacity to implement it until 2009. So in 2009, they rolled it out. Volunteers are, uh, the, all workers are volunteers. They are unpaid and motivated by altruism. The government aimed to have one village, one at least one worker for every village. In the end, they were only able, they rolled out the recruitment effort across countries. They were only able to recruit one, uh, a worker in about half of the communities and never more than one worker per village. Now, in talking to the government workers, and you know, we did a bunch of interviews, the main, there's a consensus, they're pretty open about why they couldn't find every, a, a person for every village. The main constraint uh, was that they weren't able to find a person who was able and willing in every village. So um, they were just, the, the labor is very constrained in this context. Now, one limitation of our data is that there is no aggregate data or record for of government health worker location. I should say one limitation of this, the government database. Uh, so of course, in locally, regionally, uh, government health workers, gov uh, the government, uh, the government workers know where the rural community workers are because they're restocking them with supplies, like locally in local urban areas. But there's no aggregate database um, at any level, as far as we know. And this is also important to keep in mind when we think about the NGOs and rolling out, because we're going to be telling you a story of how the lack of coordination between the NGO and the government is uh, potentially causing quite a bit of harm. And it's important to kind of keep in mind that this is not a story of like a pernicious of uh, of a pernicious NGO who doesn't care. I mean, it's actually very hard for them to coordinate with the government, which doesn't have aggregate data, right? So one of the takeaways that we're going to be pushing at the end or you know, discussing at the end is um, this is a context where there might could be really high value for the government to collect data on where its health workers are and also where NGO health workers are. Okay, the NGO we're looking at is one of the largest in the world. It has, a simil it has similar aims as the government. Just so you know, these aims are all being inspired by the Millennium Development Goals. That's why if you look at their manifesto and you read the instructions and their goals and their mission statement, uh, it, the word, even the wording is very similar. Okay, they, uh, their aim is to improve health, improve health outcomes for you know, young children and mothers. Uh, and they provide similar health services free of charge as the government. Now, in addition to providing health services free of charge, they also sell household commodities at a piece rate. Very useful health, uh, health commodities like soap, you know, it's, um, gloves, uh, iron pills, condoms, things that are things that are um, consistent with the health mission the, of the NGO. Well, when they sell these things at a piece, the health worker earns a piece rate, and this provides her with an income, right? Uh, so that she doesn't have to work for free. And this is an advantage. When the NGO ran and moved out in 2010, one year after the government rollout, the government workers were already in place. The NGOs, the NGO was able to, uh, the NGO also recruited locally and they looked for similar skills at the government as a government worker. They were able to recruit one worker for every single community. So even communities where the government uh, wasn't able to find anyone to work for them, the NGO was, right? So this could be one of the benefits of actually allowing the workers to be paid. Now, one thing to mention about screening, the NGO workers, act, the NGO actually tried to avoid hiring government health workers, but they didn't have a way of systematically screening them out. They looked for workers of the same, with the same skills set that the government was looking for. So if the government worker applied for an NGO job, she or he would naturally be one of the most competitive person for that job, and they can probably get it. Um, a little bit more on background. This is important when we think about um, spillover effects. So the government operations and the NGO presence, I just wanna be clear about this in this context, they're basically running two parallel programs orthogonal with no communication to each other, right? And part of this, uh, this is largely an outcome of the limited administrative capacity of the government. There's no centralized database. It's uh, on its own operations or NGO presence. 
And while this seems, you know, kind of extreme, it's actually not. Remember, the NGO's mandate is to be a stopgap and provide services and contacts where the government has so such limited capacity that they can't provide anything, right? So as these governments, as these countries develop, they are going to start. They're going to start to slowly try to provide services on their own, while being while having limited administrative capacity. You know, not having the database that OECD wealthier countries would have. So this context, while it seems sort of uh, chaotic uh, when you first look at it, is actually exactly the relevant context well, to think about NGOs and crowding out or crowding in government uh, services. Okay, the second thing to keep in mind is that because of limited capacity and not having data on where um, on where its own and NGO services are, the government does not reallocate the resources and elsewhere. So this, we have never heard, we asked, we looked into it because this was one of the first things that popped into our minds or the minds of economists, you know, any economists. Uh, there's no account at all, uh, anecdotally, that we came across where uh, of, of stories of the government reallocating its resources, the places where the NGO is at, right? Like the NGO comes, so now I can move my resource, I can, I can target my own resources in places where there is no NGO. And this isn't surprising when you take into account that the government doesn't have data on where the NGO is or where its own, op op uh, where its own operations are and vice versa. Okay, are there any questions about the background before I go on and talk about the data? No, I, I think that most of the questions have been answered uh, by, by Erica. Um, Abhijit had a couple of questions on, on the reallocation of resources that you just answered. And Esther is now asking, is it an unusual version of this local health worker model to not pay them at all? In India, ashas are paid by the police rate. Yeah. So, so uh, the, uh, no, go ahead. You want me to answer that, right? Yes, uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> I assume they didn't tell me that, to tell me to not answer it. Okay, sorry to have interrupted you. I'm, uh, I'm a bit of an interrupter when I get excited. Uh, okay, so that's a really good question, which is, you know, uh, is it, and it comes up a lot. I mean, it came up to us, you know, how, is, is it strange? Uh, it's about the external validity of these results, right, and the policy implications, which is, we're in a context where the NGO workers are, um, sorry, the NGO workers are getting a peace rate from selling stuff and the government workers are volunteers. So of course, not all government workers everywhere are volunteers, like everywhere, but a lot of the government workers for local, locally provided public goods are volunteers. So in the paper, we give a long list of different countries, different contexts. But if you think about it, even in rich countries, like when we think about, uh, recently we just had some presidential elections in the United States, which many of you uh, know about, uh, poll workers in the US are usually volunteers. So a lot of local public goods in many different contexts are provided by volunteers. And I think this question of what motivates people to provide volunteer services is super interesting. And that's something that you know, Eric has, been, has and been doing quite a lot of work on. But I think the thing that's really pertinent for our paper is not that uh, whether they're volunteers or not, what's relevant for thinking about our results here and later when I talk about well-being in Crowda is the pay gap, is that, is that there is just a difference, uh, is, it's a level pay gap, that um, it doesn't, it wouldn't matter, the way we interpret our results right now, it wouldn't matter if the government workers were volunteers or getting paid a very low wage, right? What's important is that the NGO workers are earning a lot more. And that's sort of what comes up in the aid discussion also, it's the pay gap. Uh, the specific levels for either type of workers is less important to us, at least that's in our current interpretation. Okay, and th there's another question uh, from sure. Martina who knows uh, the context quite well. And yes. she's saying, is it not the case that the NGO and the government are cooperating and that the government model is now adopting the NGO model. So, so is, so what's the timing? Is this a timing when it was being, it was facing? Yeah, that's a really good question. Thanks. Thanks, Martina. Um, 
who I know has been done, Martina, uh, Martina, Andrea, Jacob, David, they've done a ton of work in this context. And I know that they're doing something really exciting stuff right now. Um, so our, so this, I think this sort of addresses that question. This is the timing of the experiment that, the, our, that we're evaluating and the type of cooperation isn't really happening here. And one of the things that we would like to talk about after looking at our results and putting it together with Martina and Andrea and Jacob's past and current results is to kind of put it together and talk about implications for what the government could and uh, what the government and NGOs can, and should, can should, shouldn't do. Um, but it's not happening in our context. And another thing I wanna mention that's happening now that's not happening in our context is in several countries, including Uganda and also Sierra Leone, uh, there is a call from the government to register NGOs and create a database. So that's great and totally consistent with our findings, but that's not happening in our context. Okay, so our government, so this is a timing of, of our study. The government rolled out in 2009, it was a universal rollout. It was only able to recruit people in half of the villages. This is obviously not random. In 2010, the NGO did a randomized rollout, rollout in 127 villages in two parts of Uganda. Okay, it turns out, I mean, it was, a, a so around half of the communities in Uganda uh, in our sample already had a government worker and half of them didn't. And we have two surveys. One is a village level survey and one is a household level survey. The household level survey is a 20% sample of all households. And, uh, and if Erica can correct me if I'm wrong, if I remember correctly, they uh, gave more weight to the oversampled households of you know, young mothers and young children. Okay, and then in 2010, we, uh, we, uh, in 2012, there was the end line survey. There's about, it's almost three years between the baseline and the end line. Now, in 2010, Uganda also did a, uh, had a census, and we're going to use a census survey. To, we're going to uh, use it to supplement our data set for you know controls, balance checks, so on and so forth. Okay, I'm going to skip over this. Um, so I, I guess the only thing I want I want to mention about where our experiment is in Uganda is that this isn't the area that's you know been uh, affected by conflict. Okay. Um, NGO workers earn about $19 and work 13 hours per week in our context. So this comes out to be about $1.46 per hour. And just so that you can benchmark it and put this in context, this is about, so this weekly part-time, part-time weekly income is about 51% of Ugandan total weekly household income. So it's quite a bit of money. Um, it's comparable to entry level nurse posi positions in the urban areas. So it's for rural areas, for uh, mostly women, but also uh, mostly women who are working part-time and aren't trained as nurses, this is quite a bit of money. It's, this, is well, this is a good, well-paying job. Okay, and then, um, so these slides are, this is in the paper and I think the slides are posted somewhere also, so I won't go through every number. This is just to show you that things this is this is the balance check. So our full so the end so the, and the only thing that's randomized in this experiment is whether you get an NGO or not in the village, um, and which in, in sense NGO every village the NGO the NGO enters is going to get one NGO workers. I'll be using NGO entry and NGO worker kind of interchangeably in the talk. Uh, Column seven just shows you that it's pretty balanced across the main, the most important and relevant measures. And then we look at the subsample of villages, about half of the villages that had a government worker present at baseline, right? And we show that within this subsample, NGO entry is also balanced. So this was an internal evaluation done by the NGO. They didn't stratify by whether there was a government health worker or not. Um, so that's why we want to check whether NGO looks balanced within the set of villages with a government health worker. Okay, and then again, um, you know, now this is just to look at the balance of, for the full sample of whether there was a government health worker or not. So it looks pretty balanced, but again, uh, whether the government was able to recruit a worker or not is not random. So, you know, just interpret this, take it for what you will. 
we don't see a difference from observables, but maybe there's a difference in unobservables. Okay, now let me show you the government capacity results. Uh, oh, are there any questions about data and the timing of the data and what data we have? Um, just, just one question. Yes. Um, Avicit was asking, what is the right control group? Can it be that the government, uh, sorry, I lost it. Um, can it be that the government moves resources to control villages when the worker quits? Yeah, so um, we don't see that, right? So I'm gonna show you the results and you're going to, that, that just doesn't happen. Maybe it'll, and we don't, we don't see it in the data and we don't hear about it happening, uh, happening anecdotally during this period or even very much now. Uh, so let, let me see if this, let me see if this first set of results addresses average concern, which is something that we were actually sort of, we were quite interested in extensive. So um, I'm just, just to keep life simple, we're going to divide the data up and uh, we're gonna divide the sample up uh, we're going to divide our full sample up into villages that had a government worker and didn't have a government worker and just estimate a very simple regression where we regress our outcome on the randomized entry of NGOs in those villages. So the randomization was stratified by region, so we're going to control for regional fixed effects. Okay, so column one to three. These are villages that had a government health worker in 2010. There are 73 of these villages. And column one is a dummy variable of whether there's any government health worker at baseline. So they all had one at, so at end line. They all had one at baseline. And uh, so we wanna know whether there's one at end line. And the value, it's, uh, it, there's never more than one. So, uh, uh, so this is, we actually look at the number of health workers, but you can also interpret it as a probability because the only values are zero and one. So what we see is that when the NGO enters, uh, it decreases the number of government health workers by about one per every other village. When the NGO enters, every village gets more one more NGO worker, right? It, they always recruit more. And then if we look at the total number of workers, uh, it, you know these have to add up. So basically what we see is if we add up the total number of government health workers, so the value can be zero, one, or two at end line, uh, when the NGO enters, there's a gain of one additional health worker per one per every other village. So they have to add up. Now, so this, now let's look at the villages where there were no government health worker at baseline. So there's about, there are 54 of these villages in our sample. And we look at the same set of outcomes. We see, so for all of these villages, they had zero government workers at baseline. And we see zero at end line. So this sort of speaks to this speaks to Abbage's question about a reallocation of resources. We just don't see it here, at least not in terms of the number of government workers. And again, anecdotally, we don't hear about it, and they don't even have data of where people are. When we look at NGO health workers, again, we see every village that the NGO enters, you go from zero to one NGO health workers, and it, these two things have to add up. So for when we look at total health workers, every village where the NGO enters, there's one more uh, worker of any type, total health worker. So basically these results are consistent with poaching. Um, and they're they consistent with poaching and they show that there's no positive spillovers in villages that didn't have a health worker to begin with. Now I want to have then I want to take a deeper look at the intensive margin. Let me just check time. Okay, I want to look at a deeper look at the intensive margin, and the intensive margin. Uh, what I mean is I want to look at those villages that had a government health worker at the baseline, and uh, what happened to them when the NGO entered. So we actually have a survey from the NGO. Uh, we have a survey from the NGO of all of its employees and what they used to do. And basically what we find is that in those villages where the NGO enters and ha half of the time, they're uh, hiring an additional worker and half of the time, they just hire the government health worker. So when there's a government health worker at baseline and the NGO enters, half of the time, the NGO is able to hire an additional worker, a second person to be a health worker, and half of the time, 
they hire the government worker. And that's why we see this reduction of government health worker in every other village, but the NGO is able to hire one person per every village. Now, I want to, um, it's a little, so now I, are there any questions about our findings just on the number of government health workers, NGO health workers, and total health workers? Yeah, there's a couple of questions on, on yeah. interpretation. So yes. the first one, both are related, so I'll, I'll ask them together. Uh, the first one asks, so is this really a problem challenge of providing aid in itself, or, or is, is this an issue of, of uh, misallocation? Um, I think if the NGO did a bit more work to see how could be, to, to best make use of funding and more analysis on solution mechanisms, perhaps work with the government, etc. And the second one is, is this study able to identify what is the exact uh, sort of state capacity constraint? Uh, these papers seem to be, um, uh, are, are there something else about the information gap, the NGOs activities uh, and resources? It is also possible that there's a local shortage of human capital as well, lack of incentives. Um, yeah, thanks. So let me answer the first question. Um, so this is a, so whoever asked up a question is exactly in point. So our takeaway from this paper is that this is a story about misallocation, right? This is not a story about that aid is always bad. In fact, I'm, we're going to show you when aid delivered by the NGOs do a lot of good and, the, you know, in villages where there was no government capacity before. So this is exactly a story about misallocation. And we have some policy takeaways about things that we could do that would potentially have really high returns. Um, and then the second question about like, you know, what is the main driving force about the negative effects in the places where we see them? And we're gonna be showing you that this is all happening in those, everything bad happens in the villages where the NGO is just hiring the government worker and uh, which is consistent with a story of very limited resources, right? I mean, the relevant resources for this NGO is skilled labor. Great. So let me tell, okay, so, the, so those were like our first set of results on government capacity. And now I wanna kind of interpret that a little bit. Um, there's, so one, there's a caveat, right? You might be worried that the number of government workers are mismeasured because that comes from a village level survey to the chief of the, the village chief who might you know, potentially screw up uh, misremember who's working for who. Um, another possibility, and that, okay, so that's one, that's just like a measurement error, and it's just a caveat for interpreting these results. But let's say you take our results at face value, what's the, impl what's the implication, what's the implication of this re reduction in government capacity in terms of designing um, a, a policy design? Uh, so one concern is that this is bad, this could increase aid dependence, but NGOs could provide better or more care because these workers are, you know, paid more. Um, okay, so we're going to address both the caveat and the second question by looking at service provision and health outcomes. So service provision and health outcomes will be coming from a household level survey, where we ask the households, did you get health advice or services, you know, from the NGO worker, the government health worker, and also health outcomes like infant mortality and health behavior. So, before diving into this, I mean, I think we just want to be really transparent that these results will be very context specific, right? Whether an NGO worker provides better or more services is obviously going to depend on the incentives of the NGO relative to the government. The government we know is like really, it's really straightforward. They're just, uh, everyone's a volunteer and their only job is to provide free health services and everyone's a volunteer. Well, the NGO on the, it differs in two ways. One is that everyone gets paid. So every, uh, the NGO workers earn more relative to government health workers. The second thing is that how do they earn more? Well, they sell commodities for a piece rate. Okay, and why is this, uh, why do they do this? Well, this was a way, the commodities are chosen to be consistent with the objective of improving the health of the government. And, um, and the prices are set to be the same as local market prices and quality is going to be high. And this is a way for the NGO to pay the health workers a wage without relying on donations from institutional donors. 
and recall that the increase in financial independence from institutional donors is seen as one of the key advantages of NGO administered aid over institute other uh, aid administered by larger institutions, right? So this model has been uh, becoming increasingly popular and is widely acclaimed. So it's been written up in the New York Times, the FT, the Wall Street Journal, it's often called the Avon model. It is currently being used by some of the most famous and largest NGOs in the world, Rock, Grameen, Living Good, Swap, Vision, Sister, Solo Sister, Health Store Foundation, Honey Care Africa, and others. So again, please keep in mind, you know, so everything we want to interpret all of our results in the context of this model, and yet this model is very policy relevant. Okay, so how do we think about the parallel task model? Well, there are trade-offs. Uh, so on the one hand, the opportunity to earn something might increase the supply of aid workers, right? So there might be aid workers who are, who were willing to do the job uh, and can do it really well, but they weren't able because they were too poor. So most aid, this is a part-time job. All of these, these aid workers are mostly full-time farmers or, you know, or, um, or engaged in home production. So they have to be able to afford the time to be an aid to be a healthcare worker. So this payment might allow them that time. The second thing is a commercial incentives can crowd out altruism. So on the other hand, right, the pushback is that commercial incentives can crowd out altruistic ones. So in an internal evaluation for one of these NGOs that uses uh, this model, BRAC, um, in Uganda, they actually said, you know, this, this is, we see a problem where the Ugandan health workers are really more interested in selling stuff than providing uh, health care. They're not just satisfied in selling condoms and iron pills. They're asking to sell like televisions and things that have nothing to do with a health mission just to make more money. And we're concerned about what that's going to do to the core health mission. Recently, Wagner Lee and uh, co-authors have also provided empirical evidence that commercial incentives can crowd out altruistic ones with an NGO and a, in an NGO in context very similar to ours. Okay. So now let's first look at total healthcare services, right? So again, we're gonna be capturing the net effects in this trade-off. So this outcome is whether you get health services from either the government or the, um, oh, we lost the slide, sorry. So let's look at whether you get health services. So this is shaded out, but pardon me because we I accidentally deleted a slide. So this is whether you get health services from a government health worker. It's a household survey question. Did you get any health services from the government health worker? Uh, and again, let's start with villages that had a government health worker in 2010. So when the NGO enters, households are less likely to obtain services from the government health worker. They're more likely to obtain health services from an NGO worker. So this parallels our findings on the number of workers. But here is the interesting result. What we find is that this is a question of did you the, the dependent variable is zero one did you get any health services from either the government or the government health worker and we find a decline when the ngo enters they are less likely to get any healthcare services from uh, either healthcare worker right and just to be symmetric uh, just be comprehensive let's also look at villages that didn't have any health workers to start off with and we see that when the NGO enters, um, oh, sorry, there's a typo here. So when the NGO enters, there's actually, th these are reversed. There's no effect on government getting services from government health workers. There's an increase on uh, the probability of getting health services from the NGO health worker, just push these columns. And there's an increase on getting health services from any health worker. Okay. So this is sort of uh, so this is sort of puzzling, right? So this is telling us that uh, this is telling us that the negative effects outweigh of crowding out the effort of the NGO worker is dominating any positive effects of um, them being more incentivized by money overall. So I before moving on and looking at mortality, I want uh, I'm going to pull the data set together and instead of estimating these things for the two samples separately. I just want to pull it together to maximize statistical power. And you know, it's it's not gonna really uh, it doesn't really change identification. So when we pull all the data together and estimate this interaction model, the effective NGO entry in religious without government health worker will be uh, gamma plus beta. Uh, 
And for government worker and for villages without a government health worker, it'll be just gamma, sorry, typo, just gamma. Okay, so I wanna dive into this a little bit with, um, do I have six minutes left? Is that right? Eight minutes, we started a couple of minutes late. Ah, okay. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna resist the, the <laughs> I'm gonna resist um, the desire to speak very fast and incoherently. Uh, so when I pull the data together, so column one to three is just a repetition of what I just showed you. This is the effect of NGO entry on villages without a government health worker on uh, the effect on whether you get services from the NGO, the government, either the NGO or the government. And this here, the summation of those co two coefficients is the effect of NGO entry in villages with a government health worker at baseline, right? So this is just repeating what we already saw. Okay, so with this, I wanna look at mortality. And you know, why do we pull this, pull all the data together for mortality? It's because mortality is a rare, uh, it's like a rare outcome. So we just wanted to maximize statistical power. So we see coefficients that are going the same sign, but nothing is really significant. So when we include NGO entry, uh, has a negative coefficient for infant mortality in villages where there were no government health workers, but it's insignificant. In villages where there was a government health worker, NGO entry has a positive coefficient, but it is even less significant. So, okay, so where does this leave us? So the fact that there is a reduction in, uh, so the fact that there is a reduction in any health services is consistent, and these coefficients, the signs are co consistent with this criticism that NGOs might be crowding, uh, crowding out government services, but they're not very precise. And also they don't tell us that much about the mechanisms. So the, next, the last thing I wanna do is take a deeper look at the intensive margin again, and sort of try to tackle this limited labor hypothesis as directly as we can with the data, right? And this is sort of the question that John Marco brought up earlier from the audience is, you know, what's really going on here, right? And this is, we're gonna try to tackle this. So recall that the criticism from the A community is that the NGOs are harmful, particularly or only harmful for government capacity where skilled labor is very limited. And we already saw that in terms of government health workers, there were these villages where the NGO entered and they just hired the government health worker. So we want to get at this hypothesis of whether NGO capacity, uh, of whether the NGO is particularly harmful or only harmful in the villages where the NGO is poaching the government health worker. So we're going to decompose the data. And it's really, uh, and it's important to keep in mind that poaching is an outcome. So don't interpret this causally. This is just a decomposition exercise to see how, uh, where things are happening in our data set. Okay, so what are we gonna do is we're gonna divide the, the sample, the villages into those where the, the NGO entered and there was no government health worker at baseline, where the NGO entered and they hired the government worker and where the NGO entered and they hired a second who we assume to be a new worker, right? And when we do this, what we find, and on the bottom, you know, I summarize these coefficients. So this is the effect of NGO entry on villages where the government hired the government worker, NGO entry on villages where the government hired a second worker. And let's just focus on column three for brevity. What this shows you is that our earlier results of how when NGO enters a village where there was a government health worker at the baseline, how that reduces the probability of getting any healthcare services, like total healthcare service provision. That is entirely being driven by villages where the NGO hires the government health worker. It's not being driven by villages where the NGO hires a second worker. Similarly, when we look at infant mortality, we see that in villages where the NGO hires a government worker, the, the government worker, there is a, an increase, a statistically significant increase in infant mortality and the probability that an and that uh, at least one infant died in the household since the baseline in, in death per thousand at the village level, right? And there's no increase 
in the villages where the NGOs were able to hire a second worker to uh, a second person to be the NGO worker. There's also no decrease, there's just no change. Um, interestingly though, when we do the decomposition, we're able to be more precise about uh, everything, even the benefits of the NGO. When in the villages where there was no government health worker, the NGO, NGO entry reduces infant mortality. So the co we saw that there, this is a, the sign was also negative before we started to do the, decomp the finer decomposition, but it wasn't statistically significant, and now it is. Uh, we also look at other health healthcare outcomes in terms of healthcare behavior, and we find the, that the effects parallel the effects on mortality. Uh, and we do a lot of robustness checks. So it's 11. Are there any questions about these results? Uh, no, maybe before? let's move uh, any questions uh, to the live Q&A after, after you complete. Uh, okay. So, um, okay. So what do we find ultimately, right? I think in terms of what we document is that the NGO entry reduces government capacity in villages that already had a government worker at baseline in terms of reducing the number of government healthcare workers and the amount of services provided by the government. Now, well-being, uh, in terms of well-being and the supply of services, of any services, like total services, what we find is that that's getting worse in the villages where the NGO hires the government health worker. Again, you know, uh, where the government, and this is consistent with these concerns from the aid community that, uh, that in places where the skill supply, where the skilled, where skilled labor or the relevant resources are very limited, if when the NGO enters in an uncoordinated way with the government, they can actually hinder the development of government capacity in this infant stage of you know, development. Okay, that said, our results also are consistent with this idea that NGOs can be very beneficial as a stopgap, which is their original mission, right? In places where there's no government presence, when the NGO comes, there's no positive spillover to the government, but it does increase total services and improve well-being for the population. Now, what are the policy implications? I mean, I think this is sort of like up for discussion. Uh, one, there's a lot, there's obviously a lot of room for improvement. I, I think what we take from this is that there's room for improvement, right? Uh, that the NGO, one is that the NGO can pay more attention and make a bigger, a bigger effort to pay local market wages and to coordinate with the government in other ways, uh, such as going, designing better mechanisms to screen out government workers, or just going to places where the government isn't able to hire someone. But of course, this requires the government to exert some effort too, or you know, to keep better data on where its workers are. Um, and then finally, the parallel task model, while very attractive and as a way of funding workers and, uh, and ser free services without relying on additional donations from institutional donors, needs to think carefully about aligning the incentives so that there's no crowd out between uh, the commercial incentives and the, uh, the free of charge tasks that the workers have to provide. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Nancy. So if anyone has questions, please uh, raise your hands uh, virtually and I'll open up your mic. But I think that in the meantime, Eliana had a, had a question so, or, or perhaps Martina. So uh, I can ask my question, but I think uh, Erika just replied. I was a bit confused uh, by what's happening in the villages where the government hires the health worker, because to me that looked more like a relabeling. So the same person was called government and now is called NGO. So what was it that made this person less uh, efficient uh, and why infant mortality goes up as well? And uh, I think uh, Erika just wrote that it's because she spends too much time worrying about selling goods. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's exactly right. So one of the slides I didn't have time in the talk is actually, so this is from Reichenbach, uh, this internal study by BRAC in Uganda, you know, which is a, the largest NGO in the world and also uses this model. And they actually did it, uh, a time use survey it's self-reported, of course. This is self-reported data from their healthcare workers to see how the NGO workers using a model is um, allocating their time. And what you see here is that they allocate very little time to pregnancy identification, attending delivery, and making referrals, and a lot of time to selling stuff. And the 16% of refresher training, when we, uh, both in this, the Reichenbach and Schimmel report, and also when we talk to NGOs who use similar models, what they say is that actually the women, so the NGO pays for the women to uh, attend refresher trainings once a month in the urban areas. But they say that the women spend most of this time going to the warehouse to restock the things that they sell and very little of the 16% to actually um, learn better health techniques. So our interpretation, I mean, you're exactly right, is that when the, in those villages, in these villages that are kind of, uh, in these, in, in these villages where the NGO is hiring the government worker and where we're seeing like this decline in services and increase in mortality, this worker used to spend all of her time working for the government, which is around 13 hours a week, you know, providing free healthcare services. And now on average, they're spending around 15 to 17 hours a week working for the NGO, but they spend about 70% of that time selling things. Ballpark. And Martina? Yeah, hi, Nancy. So I find that a, a little bit confusing, I must say, because what we find in our 2019 paper is that these living goods BRAC health workers, they reduce child mortality by quite a lot in the RCT that we did on just the living goods one. And what I find confusing is that you're saying that they're now selling goods, but the goods they're selling is really ORC and zinc to kids who have diarrhea, it's malaria drugs to kids who have malaria. These are drugs that the village health workers didn't have with them, for example. And they're selling these drugs and medications and soap and salt at levels that are much cheaper than what you would find in the private uh, drug stores. So they're selling something to kids who are sick at a lower price. And, and what you're then saying is that that's a, a that's a, that's, that's, taking away time from what the village health workers would have done. Yeah, so thanks for that, Martina. So this is, uh, to Martina's point, th th this is a list of the things. So uh, so our study and Martina and her co-author studies are looking at very similar contexts and similar NGOs. So this is there's definitely a, an important comparison to be made there. And these are the things that our NGOs are selling. Um, and you can see, this is just to give you a sense of what they're selling and how much you know, the worker makes. And Martina is exactly right. Everything that they sell, so we, we lined it up according to you know, our broad interpretation of what's most directly related to health, but everything is related to health, right? And then we also show you here how much money that the NGO worker is making. That's the green line, that's your piece rate. And you see that, um, as we go further and further away, so the zinc, iodized tablet, tablets, they don't actually make that much money from selling these things. And also, but at the same time, the price, the retail price being charged for the household is also low, right? So the fact that the retail price is low when they're higher quality is good. The fact that the health workers don't make that much money relative to the other stuff means that the health workers, the NGO workers are going to be more incentivized to sell other stuff. That said, I think in comparison of the two studies, we also see you guys are estimating the average effect of the NGO. And when we estimate the average effect of the NGO entry in our context, we find positive co coefficients that are less precise than your estimates. So that so this trade-off between um, effort of how much time you spend selling stuff that's uh, less relevant to health and how much that crowds out your time in providing health services. My interpretation and the comparison is that this is gonna vary a little bit context to context, right? So you don't wanna take our numbers literally, but this trade-off definitely exists. Thanks, Nancy. Now we have a question from uh, Michaela Limardi. Uh, Michaela, your mic is open. Uh, 
Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, it was not clear for me if, uh, to me, if the NGOs uh, didn't know the lo local labor market before that, or even if they uh, didn't know at least after one year, they don't realize that something was wrong with uh, uh, the hiring of, I mean, why this, um, so if they change something over time or not, or, I don't know if it's, clear, if it's clear the question. Yeah, no, no, uh, I think I understand your question. So the NGO Central, like when they were just, uh, don't know where the government is. The NGO, um, but of course, I, so I'm gonna break up your, I'm gonna break up your question into two. One is what does the NGO know about where the government is? So NGO Central doesn't really know because there's no centralized database, but of course when the NGO enters, they, um, when the NGO enters, they know who's there, right? Like when they do the, uh, when they do the surveys, they see who's, who's there. The second question is, what did the NGO do like a couple of years later? Um, did they do anything differently? As far as we know in this context, so one thing we wanted to do was a follow-up study. So we started this like two years ago and we thought, well, can we do a follow-up survey? And we weren't able to do that in a meaningful way because by then the NGO had kind of rolled out everywhere. Um, that said, one thing I wanted to add is that, you know, uh, we're looking at a randomized rollout, which was randomized for evaluation's sake. The NGO does not actually randomize rollout when they scale up as far as we know, right? They do try to target okay. a bit. Um, and this is something, it sound, I mean, it sounds like from some of the earlier questions that this is something that Martina and her co-authors are working on right now on coordination. So we would love to talk about that some more. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Um, I think that um, Abhijit has another question, but I cannot seem to find him here to open up his mic. Uh, Abhijit, maybe you can raise your hand virtually so I can see you. This is very weird. Um, Sylvia, if anyone else question, Jamak, that you may want to ask live, I think Erika answered it, but, but other people may be interested. What's that? Sorry, Sylvia Blom also just typed in a question that I think Erika answered, but other people may be interested. So, Sylvia, if you're there, if you raise your hand, we can open your mic. Oh, okay, perfect. Uh, I'll open up your mic, Sylvia. Okay, Sylvia, yeah, you, you can ask your question now. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if you could speak to equity concerns at all. Um, I'm not sure if I missed this in the talk, but I was wondering um, what incentives there are for NGO workers versus government workers to visit all the households. And if you're concerned about uh, equity concerns about kind of health um, service access and health outcomes. Yeah, so as far, I'm gonna, um, uh, I, as far, that's a great question. So I, as far as equity concerns, our sense, um, I, wait, let me see, do I have this? Oh, here. Uh, we don't have anything directly on equity. We think that the NGO and the government are both trying, I mean, they have the same mission, right? So there's nothing, there's not a big difference. But we do, ha we do, have, we do have some descriptive results showing that the targeting is a little bit different. So the dependent variable here is whether the household receive any medical advice from the government or the NGO in villages with, uh, so this is NGO, this is government. And basically what we find, and the explanatory variable here is uh, whether the household is pregnant. And so we find that households with a pregnant women and who are poor, both seem to be more likely to get health, health services in villages where there's no NGO health worker, right? Uh, these are amongst villages that already have a government health worker based on, so I should clarify that. So in villages with government health workers at baseline, if NGO as don't enter, we see that pregnant households and households that are poor are more likely to get services, 
right? This is the p-value of the difference of the two coefficients. Of course, for pregnancy, it's not, I should say, this is not statistically significant at all. And then for poverty, it is different. In fact, we see that if you're poor, you're less likely to get served for a village with an NGO. Again, this is totally descriptive and more likely with a village with a government health worker without the NGO. And so this is, I think these results are consistent with the other results, right? In the sense that there's really no reason for NGOs to discriminate uh, to favor or disfavor household with a pregnant woman. But given that they need to sell stuff, they want to target households that can afford the stuff. But then I don't want to map, it's, it's hard to map that into equity concerns because they're all poor. And one other thing I want to mention when we think about the big picture, which we haven't focused on, is the health workers are also poor themselves. So the fact that the NGO is able to give them an income where the government isn't, that should also be taken into consideration when we think of, you know, equity and welfare in a way that our city can't do directly. Okay, fantastic. Uh, we're just on time. So, so let's uh, close the session now. And Nancy has uh, agreed to be on her Zoom link to talk to people who, want, who has more questions. Uh, uh, would it be okay at 6.20 or 11.20 your time in like five minutes? Yes, or? absolutely. Okay, fantastic. I'm just putting the, the link on the chat. Uh, thank you very much to everyone. And, and just in case you want to uh, go back over the talk, it will be posted on, on CPR's YouTube channel uh, for a couple of weeks. Uh, and we'll see each other in two weeks' time. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you for having us. Hey, thank, thank you. Very much.